My name is Professor Andrew Nix, and I head up the Communication Systems and Networks Research Group at the University of Bristol in the UK. Today I'd like to talk to you about 5G, unleashing millimetre wave communications. I'd like to start by looking at the drive to millimetre wave communications, and why this is seen as the innovative new physical layer in the 5G standard. It's all to do with the data crunch. Capacity is doubling year on year, and we're running out of spectrum. In 10 years' time, we'll need 1,024 times more capacity. We need to look at densification. We also need to share network hardware through virtualization. There's only around 1 gigahertz of bandwidth below 6 gigs, but if we look above 25 gigahertz, there's very significant amounts of spectrum. We also need to separate control and data planes across radio technologies. LTE, for example, can be used for control plane, whilst millimeter wave provide a truly high capacity data plane. 5G networks also need to offload traffic between their heterogeneous standards. For example, LTE, Wi-Fi and millimeter wave all working together. Let's look at the propagation. The antennas and propagation issue in the millimeter wave band is mainly linked to path loss. It's 28.8 dBs more loss at 72 gigahertz compared to 2.6 gigahertz. To overcome this path loss, we need narrow beam, high gain adaptive antennas, which track cellular users. This is a new challenge for 5G networks. Antenna arrays need to be physically small in the millimeter wave band. For example, a 16 element array can fit within a one square inch area. Diffraction is no longer dominant as it is in the microwave bands. Diffuse scatter is also far stronger at millimeter wave frequencies. Links are now dominated by a smaller number of significant multipath components, and polarization plays a far stronger role, particularly in line of sight channels. Now let's take a look at arrays and, and code books. Basically, whether it be for backhaul or mobile access, in either case, particularly the base station will use a high gain directive antenna to offset the high path loss that we've just seen in the millimeter wave band. In this particular example, we're using code books to basically scan through a set of specific directional antenna patterns in order to find the best one that will work for the given end user. This example uses the 802.15.3c code book based on a 4x4 array and a 64 entry code book. You can see that overall, the set of patterns covers a very wide scan angle, but any given specific beam has high gain and points in a very specific direction in order to push the energy or focus the energy towards that user. I'd now like to see how we link this together with our channel models. At Bristol, we've been working on a millimeter wave propagation model based on ray tracing, which supports first and second order 3D diffuse scatter also supports accurately polarization. Transmission losses in terms of um, foliage and also in terms of dynamic issues, people moving and moving vehicles can also be included in the tool. The antenna uh, arrays are modeled as full 3D complex voltage polarimetric antenna array patterns in the far field. This allows us to look at vertical, horizontal, left, right, circular or elliptical polarization, uh, whichever is required for the system. So, now let's look at the adaptive beamforming process. Well, we saw earlier the base station going through its, its, its adaption. Now, both the base station and the mobile handset run through their code books in order to identify the very best transmit-receive beam pair. In this animation, the scan results in a particular code book being chosen at both ends of the link to achieve the high directive gain necessary to offset the path loss seen in the millimeter wave band. Now we've set the antenna gains, we need to look at the physical layer, and in particular, we need to understand how to adapt the modulation and coding scheme. In the little animation, you see us going through from BPSK up to um, 16 QAM and at various coding rates. Obviously, the specific modulation matches the signal to noise ratio and quality of the radio channel, which in turn depends on the dynamic antenna patterns and the underlying channel. Having set all the adaptions in place, we finally come to the medium access control layer, which looks at protocols and user scheduling. The Mac is responsible for ensuring that multiple users can efficiently share the same radio resource. So putting all these pieces together, we can now take a look at this um, virtual network simulation animation. Here we see a user walking around a virtual square. On this square are several lamppost mounted base stations and a number of trees um, to provide challenges due to foliage obstruction. From each lamppost, we trace the significant components to the user and then choose the most likely lamppost. Having chosen the most likely lamppost, we then beamform and do MCS selection, allowing us to track, for example, throughput and MCS mode as the user moves in basically distance and in time. 
This animation was originally shown at the Small Cell World Summit in London earlier this summer. And if you're interested, the full presentation can be downloaded using the YouTube clip in the top right hand corner. Next, we look at dynamics. Here we have a, a London bus um, basically driving through a backhaul link. Now, we may not normally design a link such that buses can break it, but in this example, as the bus breaks the link, we can see the adaptive antenna system jumps to diffuse scatter from a nearby wall. Similarly, when the bus breaks the diffuse scatter, the main link can still be used. Even when the bus drives through the main link, we're able to achieve between 1 and 2 gigabits per second on this particular backhaul link. It shows the importance of time evolution and dynamics in the understanding and design of our systems. Again, putting these pieces together, the user is walking around the same square we saw earlier, but this time we're logging far more detailed data. Here we're able to log, for example, information from the radio channel, the Ricean K factor showing the dominance of the main components, the RMS delay spread based on the resulting um, beam formed antennas. We're also able to look at the signal to noise ratio and whether the link has a line of sight or a non line of sight to the chosen base station. And finally, at the system level, we're able to look at the throughput and also the chosen MCS mode in a time dynamic sequence. These simulations show that unlike our earlier microwave simulating capabilities that were more static snapshots, for the millimeter wave, it's extremely important to model time dynamics and basically a sequence of radio channels in time and in space in order to model the way the system adapts. Next, let's just think about beamforming in more detail. Analog beamforming is a simple, low-cost option. It supports a single user with a single spatial stream and is very and cost-effective. Digital beamforming is a, a more flexible, potentially a more powerful solution, but it is cost-prohibitive. At the end of the day, it requires too many radio chains and the return on investment will generally be poor. One interesting compromise is to combine spatial multiplexing, either in single or multi-user form, with beamforming in the form of a hybrid beamformer. In a hybrid beamformer, the beamforming sections are done in the analog domain, but we still run with two or more input digital channels at baseband. So one possible implementation is to exploit the polarization characteristics in the millimeter wave band by supporting two baseband to RF chains to basically double the peak user data rate. We choose two chains because there are two unique polarizations. Another approach would be to support N concurrent users and via end spatial beams. So this is a form of multi-user MIMO. Um, this is a very effective way of increasing the number of users we can support. However, can we separate customers in beam space in reality? Well, using our simulations, we've looked at the PDF of the elevation and azimuth angles of the strongest multipath components departing the base station to a cell phone. What we actually found was that the departure angles at the base station were not uniformly distributed in the azimuth plane but they were actually very much focused in two particular directions. You can see from the diagram the kind of red and yellow uh, spots, basically at plus or minus 90 degrees, indicating the, the strong preference for the base station's departures. On top of this diagram, we've also superimposed the 3D contours of the codebook so that you can see which codebook would be selected and used for each azimuth and elevation angle. What we see is the same beam pattern would be selected for many, many users. And in fact, this trend is even worse if we constrain users to sidewalks. Users in the same beam contour would need to be separated in polarization, time, or frequency. Now let's just take a little look at some of the hardware work we're doing at the University of Bristol. This project in collaboration with Blue Wireless Technology is looking to build a prototype. The hardware is based on Blue Wireless's innovative baseband processing chip together with third-party RF up and down conversion. We've already been performing channel sounding with this equipment. I think what's interesting compared to many other sounders is that this hardware is using a fully adaptive analog beamforming RF front end. So moving to the simulation domain, based on the parameters shown in these tables, for example, just 20 dBm of power to the antenna ports and lamppost mounting at six meter heights, we've been able to look at the performance to users. We've modeled single users at one meter. These slides show the database for a 500 meter by 500 meter area of Bristol in the, in the center of the city. And on the right hand side, we basically map from the base stations to the users, the beam forming, and also the MCS selection, we map the expected throughput as a grid. What we can see here is that 17% of spatial locations are in outage. This means they fail to achieve a gigabit per second. However, 83% of locations achieve one gigabit per second or higher. 
based on this particular deployment. A couple of things worth noting. Coverage is a challenge, particularly in some of the narrower streets of Bristol. It's also a challenge because, again, as you can see in the picture with the green, uh, green areas, there is considerable foliage. And again, multiple base stations help here. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing now in our Gigabit Bristol project. From the spring of 2015, the centre of Bristol will be offering high-speed wired and wireless communications along the Brunel Mile. This will include Wi-Fi, LTE Advanced, TV white space and millimeter wave components. The network will support a variety of open research and development projects. Each project will be managed by the Bristol is Open joint venture between the University of Bristol and the City Council. We aim to host a wide range of academic and industrial projects and many will address 5G and all will address significant social benefit. The picture on the bottom of the slide shows some of the project areas that we're thinking around. This includes areas such as energy and health to name but two. So in conclusion, dynamic beamforming mitigates the high path loss seen at millimetre wave frequencies. We've seen coverage isn't limited to line of sight. We can actually run viable links from first order scatter. Foliage is very significant in the millimetre wave bands and needs to be uh, factored into the design. 5G millimetre wave networks will support multi-gigabit backhaul up to 400 metres at the power levels we've been looking at and cellular access with 200 metre uh, lamppost separations, 100 metre cell radius. For a 500 metre square dense city area, our 5G network simulator has shown greater than 80% of street level coverage beyond a gigabit per second. I'd now like to end by basically just highlighting a couple of papers here in red. These papers will be basically available in December. The first is at Globecom in Austin, here also in Texas, and uh, the second will be in the IEEE Communications magazine also next month. I'd also like to give special thanks for Blue Wireless for giving permission for this presentation.